There we go. He's back there. The man behind the curtain. We're talking about predestination tonight or unconditional election. And um, so it's a little bit of a frightful term for some if they haven't grown up with that. Uh, everybody's going to have a perspective probably coming into this room tonight on, I'm actually reading a book called The Righteous Mind right now that was recommended by uh, one of our deacons. And he, basically the whole argument of the book is that our reasoning is ruled by our intuition. Well, that's the, and I couldn't agree more. I think that we, um, our gut even in Christianity, oftentimes we rely on it instinctually to tell us what is right and wrong. And so when it comes to a, an issue like predestination or unconditional election, uh, if we're going to be consistent, some of you have noticed, some of you are just now noticing, this is the five points of the tulip across the up here. Uh, so we covered total depravity last week. There's not as much dissent on that until you get into the nitty gritty of what we're capable of. And tonight we're unconditional election. So we, we bring our presuppositions and our opinions to the table. Some of us believe in it, but... We don't know why. Some of us are ardently against it, or in potentially we don't know why, or it's based on our understanding of Scripture, or maybe a humanistic perspective, whatever it might be. Some of you kind of feel like, and I've, I've shared this story I think once before. Um, don't think it's a true tale, but it, it could have easily taken place. Of the uh, kind of you kind of feel like the guy, the Christian who showed up uh, for a Bible study, and in the midst of that Bible study, according to the tale, an argument breaks out between the proponents of unconditional election or divine selection, predestination, and the proponents of human free will. That's the ultimate determining factor of salvation. And so there's quite the argument, as has been the case over the last 400 plus years of Christianity. There's these two fragments um, kind of divide, and one group is on one side, one is on the other, and there's that sole Christian there in the middle who says, all right, you know what, I want to know more. So he walks over to the group that is advocating unconditional election, predestination. And they say, why are you here? And he said, well, I just decided this is the group I wanted to learn from. And they said, no, you're only allowed to be here if you were selected or elected to be here. Go away. So he makes his way across the room to the proponents of free will. And, of course, they asked, why are you here? And he says, I was sent here. And they're like, no, you can only be here of your own free will. So there's nowhere to land. And maybe that's you guys tonight. Maybe you're like, or maybe somebody watching online, you're like, man, I cannot understand this stuff. It is confusing to me. Look, the, the goal Okay, I need everybody to hear this, um, whether this is your church or not, whether you believe in unconditional election, predestination or not. The goal here is not to confuse. Uh, it is certainly not to bewilder or alarm. The goal is pretty simple. And we talked about this last week, but I just want to remind you guys. Um, Deshaun, last Wednesday, last Thursday morning, recommended a little book to me uh, called, uh, what was it, Deshaun? No, I forget. Uh, anyway, the, the whole idea is uh, it's about the practical applications. I think it's called the implications of Calvinism. So it's these pr practical implications of Calvinism by Albert Martin. And in the book, he said this, a lot of great quotes, but he said this. He said, the end for which God gave his truth to us. So his word and the doctrine we distill from the word. The end for which God gave us his truth was not so much the instruction of our minds as the transformation of our lives. We have to keep that in mind. Our minds hopefully enlighten so that our lives will be transformed. Uh, in his book, Chosen by God, which I read a couple weeks ago, R.C. Sproul says this in conclusion. Okay, I don't have it up on the screen for you tonight, so you just have to pay attention. He says this, Soon after I awoke to the truth of predestination, I began to see the beauty of it and taste its sweetness. I have grown to love this doctrine. Why? It is most comforting. It underlines the extent to which God has gone in our behalf. It is a theology that begins and ends with grace. It begins and ends with doxology. Ology, the study of doxa, praise, worship. We praise a God who has lifted us from spiritual deadness and makes us walk in high places. We find a God who is for us, giving us the courage to withstand those who may be against us. It makes our souls rejoice to know that all things are working together for our good. We delight in our Savior who truly saves us and preserves us and intercedes for us. We marvel at his craftsmanship and in what he has wrought. We skip and kick our heels when we discover his promise to finish in us what he has started. We ponder mysteries and bow before them, but not without doxology for the riches of grace he has revealed. And you see this again and again, like Ephesians chapter 1. If you're familiar with that text, um, Paul lays out predestination in verse 3, 4, and 5. 
which we'll get to tonight, Paul lays out redemption, and I would argue the specificity of it for God's people in verse 7 of Ephesians 1. Uh, he lays out the work of the Spirit in sealing us for salvation uh, in verses 9 through 11. And over and over again, what do we see three times in that text? Verse 6, I think it's verse 11, verse 14, to the praise of his glorious grace. When Paul writes this masterpiece, this manifesto of the graciousness of God in the book of Romans, he comes to the end of that theological dissertation, really, before he gets into the practicality of salvation in chapter 12. And, he, and what does he say at the end of Romans chapter 11, verses 3 through 36? For from him and through him and to him are all things to him be glory, who has known the mind and plumbed the depths of the riches of God. And so this whole exercise is meant to, yes, sharpen our minds, but it is meant to move our souls. So if we finish up in the next four weeks and all, you just know more stuff and you're more sure than ever that you hate this teaching, or you're assured that, hey, this is true, but you haven't been moved and stirred, no matter which side of the debate you come down upon, then we have failed in our exploration of it. And so that is why we're going here tonight. Robert Farrar Capone, his book, brilliant book, Between Noon and Three, says this, grace, grace, we talk about a lot, is the celebration of life relentlessly hounding all non-celebrants in the world. It is a floating cosmic bash shouting its way through the streets of the universe, flinging the sweetness of its cassations to every window, pounding at every door in a hilarity beyond all liking and happening until the prodigals come out at last and dance and the elder brothers finally take their fingers out of their ears. Like this is the idea of grace. Now, he's not defining grace here. He does that in that book, but he's talking about the result of grace, the impact of grace in our lives. And so when we talk about grace and the graciousness of God, we must include in the discussion the doctrine of predestination. Now, we're going to get into this more next week. We talk about the economics of the Trinity. If you're unfamiliar with that, just come out next week. We'll talk more about it. Meaning that in complete cohesion and unity, the triune God, the three separate persons, went to separate links in unity to secure our salvation. And so predestination is a work of God the Father. And here's why it must be included in the discussion on grace. All Christians faithful to the word of God must necessarily believe in the doctrine of predestination. Now, why do we say that? Well, on your sheet there in front of you, I've got just some of the passages listed that deal with this doctrine. And when you, when you scope out just the New Testament, of course, it's in the Old Testament as well, particularly for the nation. But when you talk about um, these words, predestined or elect or election or chosen in reference to salvation or appointed to salvation or ordained to believe, you start talking about these words, um, what what you see is they constantly reoccur, dozens and dozens and dozens of times. Some of them, um, you can make note of these, you can see here on the sheet, but we'll just reference like John chapter 6, verse 37, all the Father give to me, Jesus says, will come to me, and all who come to me I will in no wise cast out. Uh, Acts chapter 13, verse 48, we talked about last week, uh, they heard, they received the word of the Lord, and they believed, and as many has been appointed to eternal life believed. It does not say as many as believed were appointed to eternal life. It's a big difference there. Between those two, Jesus actually says in John chapter 10, we'll be discussing that more next week with the atonement, but he says to the Pharisees something very interesting. I've been already studying for limited atonement, so it's fresh. And he says to them, uh, you cannot believe because you're not my sheep. He does not say you are not my sheep because you won't believe. He says it's an impossibility for you to believe because you are not my sheep, and the sheep have been given to him, gifted to him, by the Father, of course, we have Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. Even as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him in love, he predestined us as sons and daughters according to the riches of his grace. Um, and on and on these jokes, 2 Thessalonians 2, 13, we ought always to give thanks. Why? Because from the beginning, God has chosen us for salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief in the truth. So there's all, I mean, just countless these. We talked about them pretty much every series we go through. People are like, hey, are you trying to press home? Trying to grind the acts of predestination? I'm like, No. Scripture is. It's just everywhere. So that leaves us with this. Two forms. So just to be clear, on both sides of this debate, scholars and theologians both 
believe in the doctrine of predestination. If you're going to be faithful to Scripture, you've got to believe it. But what form does it take? Or what is the motivating cause behind predestination? Okay, So predestination, clearly, I don't have this on your sheet, but I think it's pretty clear. We talked about destiny. Like that's kind of something that this is, this is something kind of sketched out for you or appointed for you or destined for you to do, um, even though you might not even want to do it. It's like that was your destiny and predestination. This happens before time. So before time, destined for salvation. All right, so um, number one, two forms of predestination. The first is what's called cognitive election or cognitive predestination, or you should call it conditional predestination. It really focuses on the idea of cooperative grace, meaning that human agency, this is the more, if you were here last week, just you're tracking this, the more, certainly the more prevalent view in Christianity today, certainly the Arminian view. So they would not say that God's not gracious. They would just say there has to be a joint effort conducted between the will of God and the will of man in order for this grace to take root. Uh, it's the teaching that God before time, so this still happened outside of time, chose individuals for salvation on the basis of his foresight of those individuals choosing him. So we'll unpack this really quickly here for a second, even though it's wrong. Okay. Um, <laughs> some of you might be like, no, it's not. And that's fine. All right. So here's, here's what we have. I'm going to kind of draw a graph that I made up. It might not make sense to you, but it did to me. So this is time. It's the realm in which we all dwell. It's the only realm we understand. Things come before and things come after. The, all of our terminology is wrapped up in time. So here we are, or you are, or we'll just say the Christian is, the person who is trusted in Christ, who has been redeemed by Christ. There's the Christian, okay? And outside of time, and he can pass, obviously, between the veil of eternity and time, is God himself. But we have this idea of before time, pre-time, or outside of time, okay? So here's the idea. We know that God chooses us. He predestines us for life. But this teaching, cognitive, just so we're clear, so it's based upon God's cognitive understanding, his foresight, his omniscience. This teaching is that we choose God. There comes a point in time, and we all know that we do that, right? We've all repented and believed, hopefully, believe in the gospel. So we believe, and this is what we would call active, this faith, okay? And then God foresaw, so he kind of looked down through the corridors of time and saw that you would choose him, saw that Kevin would choose him in 2018, 2019, whenever it was, and said, because of this, I will react to Kevin's choice of me, even though this predates Kevin's choice of me, it's dependent upon or conditioned upon Kevin's choice of me, I will choose him. That's cognitive predestination. Okay? An analogy for this would be the fellow who has fallen off the cliff into the vast ocean, no beach around, he can't swim very well, He's slowly drowning. Doom and destruction are approaching him, overwhelming him in the currents there. And suddenly, piercing the darkness, comes the rescue chopper. And dropped down to him in the swirling tumult of the ocean as a life preserver. Um, and it's actually pushed up against him, up against his flailing arms. And all he has to do, all he has to do, so the life preserver, the chopper, everything, that's grace, that's God's grace, his provenient grace. Upon all of us, extended to all of us, all the person has to do is grab hold of the life preserver and hang on. And as long as they keep holding on, because if they let go, that's consistent with Arminian thought, they would lose their salvation. But as long as they keep holding on, by faith, they're secured eternal life. God sees that they're going to do this, sees they're going to grab hold, saw, saw that you were going to surrender to him, and he chooses them based on that. Now, in fairness to them, where are they getting this from biblically? So I don't want to pretend like Arminians are not biblical. Okay, some of you are Arminian or you have friends who are Arminian. So we're going to go together in exploration of this tonight to Romans chapter 8. This is really the premier text. There's a couple other ones that are a bit more vague. This is the premier text right here in what I've called oftentimes and what theologians call the Great Eight. It's really a remarkable chapter of Scripture. And of course... One of 
the few favorite verses that Christians love to abuse. Probably the premier one would be Matthew 7, 1, judge not that you be not judged. We love that one. But the other one would be Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose, which they do. That's ultimate good, though. That's ultimate good, which, verse 29, is becoming more like Jesus. And we see this, verse number 29. Look what it says here. For those whom he, ding, 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 there it is, he foreknew. For those whom he foreknew, he saw they were going to choose him. He also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, to become like Jesus. There's the ultimate good that we see in the context. In order that he might be the first born among many brothers, or in order that he'll be praised, he'll receive glory. So um, we have this clearly here in the text, those whom he foreknew. The problem, okay, you probably know this if you listen to me at all. The problem is that while he does know everything, it's not talking about events here in this passage. When our Lord, um, he's most certainly all-knowing. God's certainly, uh, most certainly all-knowing. Um, but when, when his foreknowledge is mentioned in relation to salvation in Scripture, it always has to do with God knowing people, not events. It says not what he foreknew, but rather who he foreknew. Which means by any metric, any argumentation, any unpacking of this text, that before time, in some form or fashion that we try to understand, the staff had a riveting and ridiculous conversation a couple weeks ago about this, but God encountered us. Right? He encountered you. He knew you. He knew me. He knew his people. Okay? So that's what we're talking about. Like clearly it says, for those whom he foreknew. So, um, there's another passage that we see in the book, um, one of the books of Peter, but it's the same idea in mind. Whenever it talks about foreknowledge in relation to salvation, our salvation, he's talking about encountering people for those whom he foreknew, not that which he foreknew. Okay, so very, very important for our understanding. Now, many will still believe this because of the idea of human initiation, human belief, and human reaction, and human will, but I would deny this classically within Reformed theology, biblically, Reform theology, we would deny this. So, what is the other form? All right, We have cognitive election. We also have causative election, or what's known as unconditional election, in line with our acronym, TULIP. Or operative grace, or you could say uh, monergism. Okay, monergism, the work of one. That, as I often say, the only thing we bring to salvation is the sin which makes it necessary, total depravity, as we saw last week. This is the teaching, and we would believe the truth, that God, before time, chose individuals for salvation solely on the basis of his eternal love. So it was conditioned, just not conditioned by us. We didn't have to meet any conditions. He chose us solely on the basis of his eternal love, ultimately for his unrivaled glory, without the consideration of any human achievement or human volition. So out of the whole of the human race, God chose his family members for salvation. James White, another excellent resource if you're willing to scope this out. It's a book called The Potter's Freedom. It's a reaction to, and you can read both. I would actually encourage you to read both. So Norman Geisler, this Christian apologist, Molinist, uh, wrote a book called Chosen But Free, where he's trying to toe the middle ground, which can't toe the middle ground between truth and falsity. And, and in case you're like, no, like you're too hard-nosed on this, we can all logically understand that two opposing arguments can't both be true. Okay, they can't both be true. So cognitive election and causative election can't both be true. Only one can be true, but they both can be false, but only one can be true. So Norman Gosler writes this book, Chosen But Free, in the early 2000s, and James White responds with a rebuttal called The Potter's Freedom. And in that book, he says this, God elects a specific people unto himself without reference to anything they do. This means the basis of God's choice of the elect is solely within himself. His grace, his mercy, his will. It is not man's actions, works, or even foreseen faith that draws God's choice. God's election is unconditional and final. All right? So, some say amen, some say ugh. So, 
at this point, what we need to do, so just to go back to our former analogy, just so we're clear. This is the idea that the man has not just fallen off the cliff, but he's run headlong off the cliff on purpose because he hates God. Like, now, he doesn't understand. Like, we don't understand that we're racing toward destruction, even though history and I would argue even logic, science tells us this. But we're racing toward destruction. They're in the throes of death now. They're swimming away from the rescue boat, away from the land, toward destruction. According to what we saw last week, we're going to be consistent biblically. And the rescue chopper comes in, and the spotlight of divine grace shines upon some, not all, unless we're universalist, unless we believe everybody's going to heaven, shines upon some, it shined upon you by God's divine sovereign selection, and he lowered down to you, Christ Jesus, and the Holy Spirit takes the merits of Christ and woos our sinful, swimming away, rebellious heart so that we can see the glory of salvation through the proclamation of the word. We can see the beauty of Christ Jesus, the beauty of God himself. Not in full detail, but just glimpses of that whereby our heart is softened. Heart of stone taken out, Ezekiel, heart of flesh put in that beats. We'll get to that more in week four. All of this done, so the life preserver of Christ himself, applied by the Spirit, selected by the Father, is placed around us, and we are lifted. So that as we grab hold of the raft by faith, that being a gift of God induced in our hearts by the Spirit, we grab hold of Christ by faith, we are lifted to safety. But if at any moment, which happens for us, I've often said, I've told you guys, if I could lose my salvation, I would do so probably five times a week, at least, right? Like, at any moment I struggle, my grip on Christ becomes weak, or it feels like it's not there at all. I need not fret because his grip on me does not falter. That's grace. It's grace, okay? So, two different ways of seeing this. If you're like, you're so biased. I am, because the truth is biased, okay? So, um, unconditional election. So, we start where, look, if you're here and you're like, I already hate this, this is terrible, when is this going to be over? With certainty, I can say when God wants it to be over. Because he has established the end from the beginning, right? So well, let's just do this. Let's just assume that we're all Christians here tonight. Hopefully not a stretch. And we're going to go back to where we began last week, and I'm going to be returning this every week. Where do we all agree? Where are we all going to line up? Okay, hopefully. Number one, we value church history. Like I said last week, not all equally the same, but we value church history. So what does church history tell us? So I know that I lost some of you last week. Some of you, you text me afterwards, like that whole church history thing was like the best thing I've ever heard in my entire life. And the rest of you didn't text because it wasn't. But I think the, the history of the church is important for us to understand. We have a historic faith. That's actually a really good comfort to us that millions of very intellectual people have believed this throughout the centuries, and not just the Christian faith, um, but specifically this radicality of the nature of grace in predestination. So we'll back up just tonight. We won't go as far back as we did last week. We'll back up to 1054. Massive event happens in 1054 in Christianity, known as, anybody? The schism, thank you, yes, the great schism. So up at that point in time, thousand years of church history, there's only one Christian faith. That's weird for us because there's all this multiplicity of denominations today and Protestant and Catholic and all the cults and everything else that stem from supposed Christianity. But at that point in time, though, it's just the Catholic church. Catholic, as we know from Latin meaning um, universal, part of the whole. And so it's just one universal church, faith in Christ stretched across the globe. However, since 476, it has become increasingly contaminated. Even your modern day Catholic scholarship, especially in America, would admit that that during the Dark Ages, it became very, very corrupt. It was all about greed, it was all about power, about control, and the Archbishop in Constantinople, which was the headquarters of the church in the East, got ticked off at the Pope. Now, when you get ticked off at somebody who is infallible, that's a problem. But the, uh, so ticked off, in fact, that the Archbishop of Constantinople excommunicated the Pope from the church. Okay? That's why they call it the Great Schism. That's a big deal right there. In reaction, as you can imagine, the Pope excommunicates the Archbishop of Constantinople. We have the split of the church, Roman Catholic in the West, and of course the Orthodox Church, what will become known as the Greek Orthodox or Russian Orthodox or just whatever Orthodox Church in the East. Um, about 40 years later, 
a new pope comes on the scene, Urban II, and he says, I want to unify the church in the East and the West back. We're stronger together than apart. And so he inaugurates a 200-year war. Starts in 1095, becomes known as the Crusades. Let's stamp out this new religion. It's a couple hundred years old at this point in time. Islam from the Holy Land. Let's get rid of all the Muslims. So let's send on crusades. Let's unify together as Christians and go on these crusades. Um, he also, in that same year, 1095, issues an edict or a bull. That's what they were called. Uh, it's a, just a declaration that if you go and fight for the church, east or west, you will get an indulgence. Okay, So you, you will receive, because of your work, you will receive um, part of what became known later in 1220 as the treasury of Christ and the Virgin Mary and the saints' merits. They'll be applied to you. You kind of earn those for yourself. Okay? And so they began to exercise this. Of course, about 50 years later, the concept of purgatory was introduced, which we were Protestants, so we laugh at that. Um, but it reigned supreme and put people in bondage and in terror for centuries. There was this holding cell between heaven and earth, and you could kind of work your way out of it. And then as the church kind of became savvy, no one's going to accuse these guys of foolishness in the dark ages, when they became savvy and realized, hey, this is really working. Chuck's over here, and he's, he's practicing penance, or he's going to fight in the Crusades, or he's sending his servants or his sons to fight in the Crusades, or he's getting baptized so that he can earn these indulgences. What better way to keep giving him these daily indulgences? You have one a day than cash. So Chuck, you know what? You can just you don't even have to like do penance anymore. You just give me five thousand dollars, and I'll give you an indulgence. And this literally, like now we're disgusted by this, right? But this literally is taking place. And so the whole idea of buying or earning um, your Christianity or grace, which is not grace if it's earned, began to kind of rapidly grow. Until of course we know in uh, 1502, <laughs> Dominican friar named Johann Tetzel or Johann Tetzel began to sell these around the European theater in the, the early, very early stages of what would become the Protestant Reformation. So he's selling these around. He coined that famous jingle that you might know now, when a coin in the coffer rings a soul from purgatory springs. And what it was is that Chuck now can not only buy indulgences for his past sins, like the sins he committed yesterday, so like I got really mad at Stephanie and I was yelling at her and I, oh, I feel so terrible now, but I need forgiveness and I have to earn that, or I can just give a couple thousand dollars to the church and get forgiveness, and now everything's cool with me and Stephanie. But they had gotten wise, increasingly wise over the centuries, and they said, you know what, Chuck, you don't even have to, you can buy indulgences um, for what the sins you did yesterday, but also you can buy indulgences for the sin you commit tomorrow. That sounds great, right? Famously, true story, Johann Tessel sold one of these future indulgences to a lord, uh, a lord of land, and the Lord, unbeknownst to Tetzel, was using it to then later on um, uh, accost Tetzel on the road and beat him up. But he was already forgiven for that because he had purchased indulgence. True story. Okay, so you just see the radicality of like how crazy the time was when there was this idea of I can buy or I can merit God's favor and his forgiveness and right standing with him. Um, and so Tetzel's selling this all over the place. He's also selling it now for your relatives who have gone on before and are trapped in purgatory. Don't you care about them? You can pay some money and they'll get out of purgatory. And um, in 1505, of course, lightning strikes a tree when a young uh, lawyer is on his way home from, or on his way back to school, actually, from home. And his name is Martin Luther. And he's so freaked out, he promises to become a monk and goes into the Augustinian order, the strictest of monastic orders. And in 1509, 1510... He is so overwhelmed with his own conscious guilt that he comes to the conclusion that there is no way. He says, I hated the law of God in his testimony. There's no way that anyone could ever earn or buy right standing with God. And so he begins to question everything about the church of his time, which when somebody does that, what do we do? We call them a heretic. They're a cult leader. Kick him out of the church. But he's questioning it as a professor in Wittenberg from Scripture. And then, of course, that culminates October 31st, 1517. We talked about that last week. He nails the 95 Theses, which are really just questions to the Archbishop of Mainz. He might not even nailed them on the church door. We're unsure about that. He definitely sent the letter, the 95 Theses, which are saying, hey, are these things really efficacious? Like, are they really powerful? Like, when I buy an indulgence, am I really cleansed of sin? Can we really merit grace, God's favor? And then 1518, Luther's converted. 
uh, helps to pen the Augsburg Confession, 1521. That's really the spark of the Protestant Reformation when he stood at the Diet of Worms and said, my conscience is convinced by the word of God and by reasoning. Like, I can do no other. I can't take another stand. And the church excommunicated him. They sought his life because he was preaching this declaration from Scripture, predominantly from the book of Romans and Galatians, that salvation is by grace, through faith, in Christ alone. He concluded this, and I might have it on your sheet, but he said this. The fascist idea, that's just silly. The silly idea that a person can be holy by himself denies God the pleasure of saving sinners. God must therefore first take the sledgehammer of the law in his fist and smash the beast of self-righteousness and its brood of self-confidence, self-wisdom, and self-help. Joel Osteen needs to read that one, right? <laughs> when the conscience has been thoroughly frightened by the law. So have we ever been frightened by God's law, realizing how far we fall short of it? When the conscience has been thoroughly frightened by the law, it welcomes the gospel of grace with its message of a Savior who came not to break the bruised reed, nor to quench the smoking flax, but to preach glad tidings to the poor, to heal the brokenhearted, and to grant forgiveness of sins to all the captives. This is the mystery of the riches of divine grace for sinners. For by a wonderful exchange, our sins are now not ours, but Christ, and Christ's righteousness is not Christ, but ours. Okay? So this is the idea of radical grace. Now, most of us in this room tonight would say we agree with Luther. We're Protestant after all. But if any, I would argue biblically and logically, if any merit whatsoever is added to the equation, it ceases to be pure grace, including will, including prayer, including faith, including confession. Anything conjured up from within, my own, not implanted there by God, it's no longer pure grace, right? So... What do we do? We look at church history. Okay, Luther believed this. That's good. He also had some issues we won't get into tonight. But, so Luther believed this. I've got up here five books. Okay? I've got, uh, they're going to be in chronological order. So this is the works of St. Augustine. Sorry, I'll lift it up because not everybody can see this. Works of St. Augustine. Fourth, fifth century bishop in Carthage. All right? I have here one of the Summa Theologica by Thomas Aquinas. Okay? a Catholic theologian during the early Dark Ages. Then I have here one of the works of Martin Luther, who we just have noted, the Protestant Reformation, the works here of John Calvin, or actually it's a book about John Calvin, all of his institutes that I own are at home, but it will serve the purpose tonight. And then finally, Freedom of the Will, which is not what you think it is, by Jonathan Edwards, okay? Why do I have these five books? I don't have anything up here by Spurgeon or Bunyan, who wrote Pilgrim's Progress, Spurgeon, Metropolitan Tabernacle Preacher, or John Owen called The Mind of the Puritans, or John Flavel, who was so Christological, he just kind of poured forth Christ in all of his writings and teachings, or John Newton, who was a pastor and only writer of Amazing Grace and countless other hymns, or other Puritans, or Melanchthon, or Zwingli, these reformers. I don't have any of them. Interestingly enough, they have a divergence of opinions, just like these five guys do. But I have these five guys up here, because almost universally in all scholastic circles, these five men, Augustine, Aquinas, Calvin, Luther, and Edwards, are seen almost universally in Christianity as the five greatest theologians since the apostolic era. Now, when I talk about church history, we talk about church history and the value of it. Really important, when we come to a doctrine like predestination, where these men have disagreed on different things and all the others I mentioned and countless more, but these five men are all in complete alignment on the doctrine of unconditional election. Complete alignment. As well as all those men I just mentioned. And I would argue prior to the mid-20th century, about 98% of Christian theologians throughout the centuries are all in complete alignment. Not here. Not with cognitive predestination, but here. Time. Causative. Election. Here we are, dead in sin, right? God, before time, 
active based on his demonstration of grace, we choose him. We do actually choose him. Right? We exercise our volition toward him because he has made us willing reactively. It's not a joint effort. It's not dependent upon us. All five of these men taught it this way. All the theologians we respect throughout church history teach it this way. And look, they could all be wrong. And you could be right. Or I could be right. I could go against all of them. But if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do so like Luther did in the 16th century with trembling. Here I stand before God, I can do no other. So we do value church history, hopefully, and we look at this and go, what does the legacy of the saints teach us? Like, what are the, the br most brilliant minds, the most humble theologians of all time, what do they tell us? Unconditional election. Number two, we esteem the glory of God. I know, we're running out of time. We esteem the glory of God. So I shared the two analogies earlier, lifeboat. We just ask ourselves, which one? And you might come to a different conclusion than me. I think one of them makes God seem way more gracious and glorious than the other one. But, um, and we trust the scriptures. So the question becomes for us in the final few minutes here tonight, is unconditional election biblical? This idea that God steps forward. To answer this question, we go to numerous passages of scripture, which we've already outlined some of them. We're going to go to Romans chapter 9. It's just probably the best. For this argument, anyway. Romans chapter 9, Paul is writing once again here just about the, uh, for lack of a better word, uh, the scandalous radicality of God's demonstrative grace upon the undeserving. And we're going to pick up here in verse 10, and you can kind of read it with me. And not only so, but also when Rebekah had conceived children by one man, our forefather Isaac, though they were not yet born and had done nothing, either good or bad, in order that God's purpose of election might continue, not because of works, but because of him who calls. She was told the older will serve the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have loved less. At least that's how we read it. For what shall we say then? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. So he knew your argument 2,000 years ago. Verse 10 through 13, that's not right. What shall we say? Is there injustice on God's part? By no means. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. So then it depends. What's it? Salvation. Standing with God. It depends not on human will or exertion, but on God who has mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I might show my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. So then he has mercy on whomever he wills, and he hardens whomever he wills. You will say to me then, why does he still find fault? How can he possibly hold people accountable? For who can resist his will? But who are you, oh man, to answer back to God? Well, what is molded? Say to its molder, why have you made me like that? Has the potter no right over the clay to make out of the same lump one vessel for honorable use and another for dishonorable use? What if God, desiring to show his wrath... And to make known his power has endured with much patience vessels of wrath prepared for destruction in order that to make known the riches of his glory for the vessels of mercy which he has prepared beforehand for glory. I will never, there are certain moments in ministry, you know, you just don't forget. And I'll never forget, I had just taken a youth pastor, high school pastor job in Foley, Alabama at a Christian Missionary Alliance church. And um, it was like first week on the job. We had, the church was kind of, out on the outskirts of Foley, but right downtown Foley, there was this really cool little cobblestone walkway area, and there was a coffee shop, and above the coffee shop was office space, and the church rented me and the middle school pastor office space. We we're gonna share this big office space so we could hang out with the kids up there. Really cool little setting. And so Ryan, the middle school pastor, and myself are up painting our office, and we're just talking. We're talking, and we're getting to know each other, we're talking Christianity and theology. And I was an idiot back then, meaning that I just believed that Christians believe the Bible. But um, I was just sort of painting, and we're talking about the Bible, and I started talking about Romans, and he goes, uh, yeah, I don't really like Romans. And I go, oh, why is that? And he goes, because Paul was a Calvinist. <laughs> I was like, what are, you, what are you talking about? He's like, actually, you see it in all of his writings. He believed in predestination, unconditional election. You know, at that moment, I couldn't, I couldn't even think what to say. But uh, I should have been like, what do you read then? I found out later he reads Rod Bell, so that should have explained a lot. But, um, but he, he literally approached half the New Testament saying, I can't read this stuff. 
I don't like this stuff because with a clear mind, thinking clearly about the scripture, it is clearly saying something that I don't believe in, that I don't like. Now, as we read Romans 9 tonight, that might have been you. Might have been. Or somebody watching online once again. You might read this and be like, no, I don't like that. We need a, a workaround here. But what we're going to do is we're going to see four realities of unconditional election here in the passage. Okay, and we'll be done. Number one, the logic. of un Logic is not the enemy of Christianity. It's the friend. Our God is a God of logic. Jesus is the logos, the ultimate logic. And so the logic of unconditional election, and he uses a, an example here, okay? An example between Jacob and Esau. Now, I said this about Samson thir last Thursday and Sunday, that we create superheroes out of these really fallen, flawed people. Um, we tend to do the same. You've been with us long enough, or maybe you've just been in the Christian life long enough where you don't do that anymore. But I think growing up, once again, it was like Esau's bad and Jacob's good and God doesn't like bad people and God loves good people. And that's how we explain that. That's how we understand it. But when you study the text just from what we see, um, they're both pretty jacked up. And if we're honest, we would probably like, at least the dudes in here would like Esau more. He had a beard from birth. Um, he... he uh, he was out hunting all the time, and just um, a dude's dude, right? And, uh, and us, us guys probably don't want to emulate, and you girls probably wouldn't be attracted to Jacob. He was smooth, but not in the way like, like you know, like Jay-Z. Like smooth, like, <laughs> like he, was, he was childish. He was soft. What's the idea? He's, you know, I've said it before, he's like baking cakes and muffins all day in the kitchen. And, he's, and that's, that's Jacob, and his name literally means deceit. His name means deceit, so, and he lived up to his name. He was a deceiver throughout his life. And Esau is the firstborn on top of all that. So he's stronger. He's a hunter. He's favored by his father. He's the firstborn. And so it's pretty mind-blowing for them, even in the first century, over a thousand years later, to hear this declaration before the children had even been born, before they had done any good or evil according so that God's plan of election would stand, God said, Esau is my enemy and Jacob is my friend. And you're like, well, because, because he did. Like, this is really important. Today was, to, uh, Sunday was Jeffrey's birthday, right, wherever he is. Okay, happy birthday again, Jeff. And today, um, what we do here for the staff is when it's their birthday week, they get to pick where we're going to lunch. And so, I don't know, 10.30 this morning, Jeffrey texts, and it's like, hey, where, where should we go for my birthday? And we're all like texting, he's like, I just wanted to work you guys up, I haven't decided yet. And, um, and then he decided, and it was my guest, Dunedin Smokehouse, he loves the wings there. Um, and we went to Dunedin Smokehouse for Jeffrey's birthday. Why? Because Jeffrey wanted to go there. And you're like, well, but why did Jeffrey want to go there? Because he liked Dunedin Smokehouse. But why does he like Dunedin Smoke? Because it pleases his taste buds. Some of us, when we come to election, and I get this, believe me, I get it. I was on a journey too. You're like, but why would God do this? Because he wanted to. That's it. We don't like that because we want to be God, but he wanted to. But, but why would he want to? Because it pleased him. That's reason enough. That's why we do everything we do, but we're fallen. We're image bearers. He is the image. He is God himself. And so, that's why he does what he does. This is the logic of divine election, unconditional election. And here's the reality for us, whether we like it or not, whether we've ever thought of this or not. Nobody gets ticked off that God came to Abraham and saved him. Nobody gets mad about that. Abraham was not at an elevation concert worshiping Jesus and came down the aisle and prayed the prayer. Abraham was a pagan who had no reference of God probably a, Zo um, what's the term, Zoastrian, whatever it is. He's a worshiper of the stars and the galaxies and what he can see and what he can put his hands on. He's an idolater. And God comes to him and shows favor to him, like, like he showed favor to Noah, like he showed favor to, and after Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph. Like he shows favor, grace, has said. So he shows favor. Now, none of us are mad about that, I don't think. We're not like, how dare he? 
You know, Abraham didn't deserve that. But what happens then is we go, but he references Pharaoh here. And clearly God didn't do the same thing for Abraham that he did for Pharaoh. And they were both the same. They were both uh, swindlers and deceivers and wretched and outcast. And God showed favor to one and not the other. Uh, it shines a light even more like we could compare um, a couple. I was listening to R.C. Sproul about this. And he compared Caiaphas and Pilate and Saul of Tarsus. So in Acts chapter 42, Caiaphas, who condemned Jesus to death, has this illuminating experience, a radical work of the Holy Spirit. He's at a revival and a tent revival and comes to faith in Christ. In Acts 53, Pontius Pilate, who had condemned Jesus to death, hears the word for the first time his eyes are open. He's like, yes, no, there's no Acts 42 or 53. Okay, it ends at 28. But in Acts chapter 9, a terrorist, specifically against Christians. There's really no other word for Paul. Right? He's just a terrorist. He is literally dragging men, women, and children out of their homes for professing faith in Christ and killing them. And he's on his way, and it says he's literally breathing slaughterings against the church. It's his essence. And Christ comes by grace. I mean, that's his testimony in Philippians, by grace. So the biblical reality of divine grace, by the most basic of interpretations, is that it is completely undeserved, otherwise it ceases to be grace. Look, we're not mad about God not showing grace to Caiaphas, probably. Unless we have an axe to grind. Or not showing grace to Pontius Pilate. They died in their sin. They got what they deserved. They didn't get God's meanness. They got their dessert. But then we get upset that God showed such radical grace to some in our day and not others. And he says here very clearly in the text, so that God's purpose of election would stand... He says, before they're born, Jacob I loved, Esau have I hated. Spurgeon says this. I come to the hardest part of my task this morning. Election in its justice. Its rightness. Now I shall defend this great fact that God has chosen men to himself and I shall disregard it from a rather different point of view from that which is usually taken. So listen close to this. He says this. My defense is just this. You tell me if God has chosen some men to eternal life that he has been unjust, I ask you to prove it. The burden of the proof lies with you. For I would have you remember that none merited this at all. Is there one man in the whole world who would have the impertinence to say that he merits anything by his maker? If so, be it known unto you that he shall have all his merits, and his reward will be the flames of hell forever. For that is the utmost that any man ever merited of God. God is in debt to no one, and at the last great day, every man shall have as much love, as much pity, and as much goodness as he deserves. Okay? So, we talk about the logic of unconditional election. We're talking about the reality that Abraham and Paul and, and Pharaoh and Caiaphas and Pilate, they were all bad. And God saved some and not all. That's the logic of it. We get the example here from Jacob and Esau. But secondly, we come to the justice of unconditional election, which is talking about. The justice of it. So two scenarios really quick. And we'll have to move on from this because we are completely out of time. Two scenarios really quick. Um, one is when I was a sophomore in Bible college, I was borrowing my friend's car and was down in Illinois on Thanksgiving break, had friends in the car, pulled up to a light. It was red. I was three or four back in line and I pulled through a gas station to cut the light and a police officer pulled me over and gave me a ticket. I think it was for $312, which m might as well have been 10 million as a college student. Okay. So 312, that's one scenario. Second scenario. Um, I told you guys about this not long ago. I was driving down. We were um, staying at Bel Air Beach while our house was being worked on. And had pulled onto Bel Air Beach late one night after hanging out with the staff. Got pulled over by a cop because I was going, I don't remember, 37 and a 22 or something. It's like weird. And 
he, uh, he talks to me for a little while and he's like, hey, I'm, I'm gonna let things pass and just give you a verbal warning and you can go on your way. In which situation was the police officer just? Both, okay? Because justice lies, and this is, the, this is the problem with social justice in our day, like the, some of the arguments is what platform we're arguing from, but justice has been bequeathed upon the police officer and if he acts according to the law, he can decide legally, justly, to grant mercy or to grant desert, like a fine, both. When we talk about God, his just, you, should, you should make the argument, and I would completely agree with you, that it's not fair. God is not fair. Spurgeon has made that argument. Because fair is a, is a matter of desert. It's what we deserve. So all those outside of Christ... So we're all swimming away from him, right? In destruction. All those who drown, destroyed, in their rebellion, of their own volition, get what they deserved. And that's just. All those who the chopper comes in and the life belt of God's grace of Christ is applied to them, get not what they deserve, but what Christ deserved. They get mercy, but the authority lies in the Godhead, and whatever he says is right, is just. Fairness or mercy? What does Paul say? Well, we don't have time to read it again, but you can see it there. Who are you? Who are you? To reply back to God, well, a thing formed, say the one who formed it, I don't like this, you have no rights. Um, what does he say in verse 19? Why do you still find fault? Who are you to answer back to God? So, there's that. All right, we just, we're out of time. The truth of unconditional election. It's clearly here in the text, so much so that it's one of the tattoos on my arm right here in the Greek. It says, so then it depends not on human will or exertion. So just so we're tracking, if it's by human will, it's not grace. If it's by human exertion, it's not grace, but on God who shows mercy. He has mercy on whom he chooses or who he wills, and he hardens whom he wills. And then finally, the last that you see here is the mercy of unconditional election. Mercy. So my kids, there's a fight at dinner every night. Daniel made some healthy stuff and they don't want to eat it. And the rule is, like probably for most of you, you clean your plate, you get dessert. When they clean their plate, they get dessert. When they don't clean their plate, they don't get dessert. Unless at times I'm home. And then when Daniel's not paying attention, I clean their plates for them. So I take the broccoli and the carrots and everything else, and they get dessert. Okay? The reality, the mercy, and that's a very trivial way of looking at it, but the mercy of divine grace is that Christ takes our roughage, our sin, our dessert, and not in the like chocolate eclair way, our merits, and he gives us, by God's grace alone, his righteousness or his merits. Okay? That's what he's going after here. That's what he's clearly saying. Verse number 23 again. Um, sorry. Yeah, verse number 23 again. In order to make known, he does all this in order to make known the riches of his glory for vessels of mercy, which he has prepared beforehand for glory. Look, there's a ton of, we should, we should take weeks and weeks talking about this stuff, but we're not going to. Um, but we are going to do a Q&A. So we're going to take a three-minute break. We'll come back, we'll do Q&A. We'll try to get you out here just right around eight o'clock. Text any questions that you have. We'll try to answer them in the time allotted. All right, let's do it. We're gonna try to get you guys out right around eight. We start going past. I will not judge anyone who wants to leave to watch the lightning. I would just assume you have a perfect understanding of unconditional election. Okay, hello? Oh, sorry. Okay, can you explain Molinism? Okay, sorry. So Molinism is the kind of in-between realm that uh, one of my favorites, C.S. Lewis, walked in. William Lane Craig, some of the modern-day apologists like Robbie Zacharias, supposedly, walked in that. And that's where, the, it's basically the classic teaching is, is that God uh, orchestrates things knowing what our natural intent would be. And so it's kind of like you put kids in a room and put cookies down on the table and you come back and the cookies are gone. Like, that's the idea of Molinism is he's not forcing us to do that, but he's still sovereign because he's orchestrating events knowing our tendencies. Um, it's been condemned throughout church history. Lewis himself, as brilliant as he was, as an apologist, was not a theologian. He admitted that. 
And, but um, it's, it's a way, the workaround for some apologists to understand God's sovereignty, that man is not ultimately in control. It's not ultimately his decision, but yet at the same time without God coercing or um, arousing or romancing them, alluring them, whatever. We are called to the Great Commission in Matthew 28. How then can we know if we are sharing the gospel with the elect versus the unelect? So I would say that we don't know. <laughs> so uh, there's no like S on the chest or E on the chest um, waiting for them to share. But the thing about it is the Bible still calls us to preach the gospel. And it actually gives us hope that it will actually land on hearts. And there will be people that will be saved. Because even if you were to think about it theoretically of, let's say that God did not choose anyone and this was all up to chance. The gospel could have just been dead within the first couple of years. But... Because God is sovereign, because he has chosen some, we do have confidence that when the gospel goes forth, there will be some that will be saved, even though we don't know who will or who won't. Double versus single predestination? Yeah, so that's, that's actually a really good question. We have an entire podcast, an hour long, on this. <laughs> and um, Spurgeon, Spurgeon said that double predestination in a truly active, active sense is heresy. And I wouldn't go that far, but I would say it's egregious error, uh, meaning that reprobation. So those who go to hell, like Spurgeon would say, and I completely agree with this, go to hell because they don't want God. So it's their just desert. No one's twisting their arm. God's not twisting their arm to get them to go to hell. Um, you see passages in Scripture that say they're destined for destruction versus predestined. There is a difference between those two things. And so we would say, I would say, and I think the confessions confirm, he's passive in those who are damned or the reprobates, passes over them, could save them and doesn't, and is active in, in redemption. And there's been some disagreement, and there's some guys out there who believe in double predestination equally, um, but I can't see that biblically, and it doesn't. Um, Romans 1 says they'll stand before God, and they'll, say, they'll be without excuse. They won't just say, I'm without excuse. They'll actually be, God says, without excuse. It'd be a really good excuse if God just, like, made you go to hell. So... I don't think scripture contradicts itself. Stephen Lawson taught that for new and Romans 8 was synonymous with for loved. Your thoughts on this? Yes. Yeah. That's God encountered us. God loved us. Same thing. He's always loved you if you're a child. He's always known you. You've always been chosen. Thoughts on the corporate view of election? Um, so if I'm assuming what you're talking about is when people are looking at Esau and Jacob and they're saying that God's election of them was tribal, so the whole entire group, but not specifically people. And so even if, let's just say, for example, you do say that example, that mindset, God is still choosing a select amount of people. He's choosing them for that purpose. And so even in that, God is still sovereign in that election of choice. And so I know people use that to kind of get away from him choosing specific and using it as groups. But even in that, he's choosing a particular people for a purpose. And as Paul is saying over and over again, it is not based off of what they've done. So even God's choosing of them is not merit-based, but it's purely out of his own good pleasure. Co corporate election is very clear in Scripture, the nation of Israel. But to try to make Romans 9 a corporate text, I think he's doing a disservice to the text. And even then, there are countless other texts which we have seen that are talking about individual election very clearly. So um, corporate election does stand, but so does individual election. Um, how can we say God is good if this is true? Goodness is linked to justice. So we don't define what's good. Just like we don't define what ultimately is right or just. Right? I mean, as Christians, hopefully we agree with that. God ultimately defines everything. And so whatever he does truly is good. Like, he didn't heal my little girl's heart defect. And I'm not real happy about that, if I'm honest with you. I don't like that. Like, um, my, I've lost two grandparents in the last year, year and a half. I'm not real happy about that. Death still happens. And God is sovereign. And he's good. And we can either believe the truth, or we can believe something based on the estimation of what we think goodness is. I mean, that's kind of what Paul's saying in Romans 9. Like, who are you to decide what's good or what's just or what's right? Like, who are you? Who, who am I? Like, that sounds ridiculous. Like, I'm just created, and I'll die and be dust and gone, and no one will remember Aaron Kern, and God remains. 
So I'm going to add one more thing into that. So similar with good and fair, all these things, as Aaron was saying, we have to base off of some standard. So there's a, a guy who's an apologist by the name of Frank Turkish. And so he says, speaking about particular atheists, where you're sitting in God's lap to slap him in the face. And so even as you come with the questions of good and fair, and we all do, but the reality is we need some standard. And then in that same breath, we have to say, how does God define goodness? And so in all of that, as much as we would like to have these concepts of good and fair, and we think they're just out there and just understood, they actually come from a source, and that's from the Lord. And so as we look at this, we have to understand that God is one who determines truly what is good. Now, at the same time, God has made us logical creatures, too. So what Sean said and what I said, I believe, is true. Um, but we're logical, so I'll just take, for as an example, all examples break down when we're talking about God, but um, I adopted Spurgeon, my son, who's been here at VBS all week, who I adore. I adopted him because he was in need. I adopted him because I set my love upon him. Like, you, should, you can add any other reasons that you want. Adopted Augustine. There are still thousands of children not adopted in Pinellas, and no one would say that I am unmerciful or unloving because I didn't adopt all of them and did adopt my children. And you could, you could argue resources, but quite honestly, I could raise the resources to keep adopting more. You could argue time, but I could di divide my time. Like at the end of the day, I'm, we made a decision, my wife and I made a decision that we're gonna adopt these two boys and we're probably not gonna adopt any others. And you wouldn't call me unjust or unmerciful. I think you would say the opposite. You'd be like, that's very loving. Like God has selected some, like he loves some, he loves his kids. He, he loves who he loves. And it's, there's no injustice in God. Or lack of goodness. In Psalm eighteen twenty five, it says, "With the merciful, God shows Himself merciful." Does that contradict Romans nine? No, no, because Scripture never contradicts Scripture. Um, but I mean, we have to understand, like, there is definitely, definitely, clearly in Scripture a First First Corinthians fifteen. If you continue on in the faith. Um, Adam Powers, who's on our podcast a lot, who's very reformed, believes in unconditional election, texted me right before class last week and was like, hey, what are your thoughts on God saying, hey, here's conditions of the covenant for Abraham, and if you don't meet these conditions, I will not be your God, or even like we're seeing in Hosea, and yet we believe in radical grace. And I'm like, well, they, a true believer will meet the conditions of the covenant because they have been made willing by the sovereign goodness of God to do so. And so a true believer will demonstrate love. A true believer will, at times, we're gonna struggle, but will be merciful. And there's also a temporal consequential element that has to be factored in as well. And so are we talking about ultimate mercy? Because then that's a work. Like whoever, Psalm 18, like whoever's merciful will receive mercy by God. Are we talking about ultimate mercy there? Because then it's like, hey, just be merciful to other people and you'll get God's mercy. And none of us believe that, right? And so that has to be a condition, temporal elements, um, or else it is a covenantal declaration that God is willing his people to be merciful so he can keep renewing them with mercy. Can you be a member here if you don't agree with this? Yeesh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, there's, there's a, I mean, if you're like, I hate this, this is heresy and Aaron and Deshaun are going to hell. Aaron quicker than Deshaun. Like if you're if you're like that, if you're then this probably is not the church. But if you're like I don't understand all this, it's confusing. Uh, like I've been hit with a fire hydrant of theology over the last two weeks. Like I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. Is gonna be a pursuit. Like it took me a couple years. Like with all this stuff, it takes a lot of theologians, pastors, Christians, years and years to try to reconcile and walk through this stuff. And we want to be here for that with you guys. We want you to be able to ask your questions. We're all worshiping Christ. We're all believing the Word. And so we welcome, that's something in our membership class we talk about. Hey, this is where we stand, so no surprises, but you don't have to line up on all these points to be a member here. If God will draw his people to him, how hard do we need to work on explaining God to others? So God will accomplish even through our poor attempts at evangelism, but we're still called to be faithful to it. And so going back to that, First question, if we don't know who or how, and we don't know all the workings of how God is drawing people, who he's going to save, we're still called to be faithful. And we're going to bumble through that. We're going to fumble through that. But it's not an excuse, though, at the same time to say, hey, I just don't understand any of this. And so we're called to diligently study God's word, to know it, to be able to dive into it, to explain it to others. And so the call for us is still to be faithful to explaining, teaching, 
proclaiming the gospel and trusting and resting in God to do the work of actually changing hearts. We should want to represent God as accurately as we possibly can because we're his people. We don't want to lie. Um, but we're going to make mistakes. We're going to draw false conclusions at times. As, as Jeffrey's like, please tone down the snarkiness. As snarky and jocular as I am in this class, I understand that when I get to heaven, I'm going to be like, oh, wow, I didn't know that. Or I was wrong about that. And some of you are like, yes. Well, you will too, okay? Like, we all are going to be there. And so we're trying to do the best we can with the revelation that God has given us to know him and to explain him to others. And then, like Deshaun says, he takes the foolishness of what is preached in 1 Corinthians and saves those who believe. Here we go. How to explain to an Arminian Christian that they are part of the elect? Well, I would probably do a different Deshaun. He'd be like, so Don Deshaun would be like, oh, look, oh, yeah. I'd just be like, dude, you're chosen and you can't help it. So um, <laughs> you're going to have a lot wiser and kinder. Oh, no, no, not at all. No. She said Arminian Christian, not just Arminian. So I mean, I'm Calvinist Christian too, not just Calvinist. Like somebody can be a Calvinist and not be a Christian. Somebody can be an Arminian or Molinist and not be a Christian. But if we're truly children of God, like, there is an element, and don't let anybody, any Calvinist ever tell you, there's not true, there is truly a choice made. I hate, like, when we go to camp, we go to camp in the past, and my students are so wise, they're like, oh, these people are making these choices, we don't make any decisions. I'm like, what? Like, it's like Paul, Paul doesn't say the Philippian jailer, hey, if you're elect, you're elect, and if you're not, you're not. He's like, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul understands better than probably all of us that if he believes, he's, it's because he's been elected to believe. And if he doesn't, it's because he hates God. Is there a book about the history of the church that is told in story format? Oh, okay. Um, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, the Jesus Storybook Bible. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, I'm kidding. No, um, probably the best, if I'm honest, is Bruce Shelley wrote a book called um, Church History in Plain Language or in Plain Speech or something like that, in Simple Speech. Uh, it's still big. I mean, it's a lot of history. But, uh, I mean, a lot of them are like multiple volumes because you're talking about, there's some good podcasts out there too. There's one called Church History in like 10 minutes. It's like 12, 13 minutes long. But he just, it's a synopsis of different centuries or 50 year periods of time. So it's quick. But uh, if you're interested in that, we can definitely direct you. But I would say um, that Shelley book is really good. Okay. Yeah, one more. Yeah. Would it be a lie if we were to tell people that God loves them? Oh, you want to say? Um, so, this is how I understand it biblically. We're going to get into this more with limited atonement. If you're newer to this and you thought your mind was blown this week, just wait till next week. Okay? <laughs> just wait. All right? And some of you are so mad right now, but whatever. Um, so, the way I would say it is this I love, I love Eden. Right? Um, I love Don's five kids. Well, four of them. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding, but I'm joking. Um, you know, like, I, I, love, I love Jeffrey's kids, Tim's kids. Like, I mean, I love these kids. Like, truly, like, we love them as image bearers. We have a relationship with some more nerds. I don't love any of them like I love Evie and Spurgeon and Augustine. So you wouldn't say I don't love them. I do love them. There's just a more specified, deeper, covenantal love, if you want to say it that way, unconditional love for my kids. And so I would say God does love all people. Um, unwilling, we'll talk about this next week as well, 2 Peter 3, 9, unwilling that any should perish in one sense or desires for Timothy 2, 6, that all be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Okay, we can talk about what that means. There, there's a generalized love for all people, but even the Arminian, I think if they're thinking, would say there's a special, hopefully they would say there's a special love for God's people, like for his kids. You can take a different position. Okay, cool. So, uh, <laughs> so I would say, um, so depending on what you mean by love, as Aaron was getting at, that specified, he's chosen, he set his affections upon people that are his versus a generalized, we would call common grace, his care for just all of humanity in a particular way. And so I would personally, and not to from what he was saying, but I would personally lean away from saying, hey, God loves you to every single person because normally what we're trying to communicate, and we could be wrong in the sense of, what if they don't actually end up being part of the elect, or even as we we're talking about them being chosen or not chosen, I would shy away from that, but just saying in general sense that God has shown his grace to all people, 
and he has set his love upon his special effectual, effectual love upon his people who he's elected. And so I would lean away personally from telling everybody that God loves you. So I wouldn't. Yeah. So, but we're, we're different there. I mean, I think that I think that I could honestly say that I think I can say like I loved Osama bin Laden like, as an image bearer, as a person. Like, if we're pro-life, we got to be pro-life in all realms. We can't just be, like, pro-life with babies. So we're pro-life, like, we believe all, all people are special and unique and valued by God. And so we love him. At the same time, I was an enemy of Osama bin Laden. And there was a certain hatred, a right hatred, um, not only for what he did, but toward him, the essence of who he is. And so I think that when it says, Jacob, have I loved you so have I hated it? I think there's an actual hatred. It's not just a lesser form of love. I think there's an actual hatred in the heart of God. At the same time, if I'm that complex... We're talking about a finite person versus an infinite being. Um, how complex, because uh, we've, we've, we've unpacked the seven different wills of God before. Like, how complex is God? So I, I can rest going, hey, I believe that God has a generalized view for all pe- uh, love for all people, but there's a special covenantal, sacred, deep love for his kids. Appreciate you guys coming tonight. If you have more questions, you can follow them in. And uh, next week, 645, limited atonement will be fun.